Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 618. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. It's September 11th, 2020. Okay, before we get too far into the program talking about the Anglican things that we talk about, I need you as faithful viewers to do a couple of things for us, and you do this because you love us. First, you're going to see somewhere on YouTube or Facebook that little thumb that is pointing up. Don't, don't click this one. Click this one. And it will help the algorithms at YouTube and Facebook know that this is a popular program, and they should be promoting us as well. It's, it's like free advertising. Also, if you want, and we would really love this, just share us. You click the little share button. You can send us to Facebook, Twitter, um, Instagram, all those social networking sites, or you could even email us around. We're not picky. However you want to share us is fine with us. In addition, we want you to be sure that you have subscribed to our program on YouTube. It's very important for those uses. Well, when's the next unscripted coming out? Well, you get an instant notification if you're subscribed. All you do is click that little red rectangle, up pops the bell, and the bell is the instant notification bell. You click that, you will be notified the second I click publish on the next episode of Anglican Unscripted. And finally, the comments. You guys, you're kind of the higher brow commenter because I see other commenters on other websites and other places like Facebook and th they don't compare to you guys. You guys are educated, you have good theology training, you're smart, clearly you're good looking. <laughs> Come on. And sometimes when George and I are just a little bit in error, you help correct us and we do appreciate that. So let's move on to September 11th, a long, long long time ago before i was an it business owner before i ran anglican tv i was a teacher at a inner city school in waterbury connecticut and every morning i would get up and uh, take my kids to school with me or we would drop benjamin off at daycare and i would listen to i think it was wtic radio 1080 on the way to uh, the daycare and uh, on this particular morning, I was just marveling how blue the sky was. Man, that is a blue sky. And we've lived in Connecticut at the time for uh, almost 10 years, and I'd never seen the sky that blue. It was just vividly blue. And there was breaking news on the radio. Breaking news. Doo -doo 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 -doo. A small plane has crashed into the South Tower of the World Trade Center. I look again at the blue sky, and I go... How on earth, on such a vividly blue sky day, did you miss the World Trade Center? Did you not see it in front of you and, you and you hit it? And as the rest of you know, throughout the day, we got further updates. Moments later, it was announced that it was an airliner. And uh, almost uh, uh, 15 minutes later, ooh, a second plane has hit the World Trade Center. And 45 minutes after that, uh, a plane has crashed into the Pentagon. And they uh, immediately take President Bush, who was at a elementary school somewhere in Florida, and put him on Air Force One, and then fly him out to I think Nebraska. There was a uh, a base out there, and that's instantly our new reality for us. And we had a new normal. That new normal was a fear of terror. That new normal was a fear of um, what's coming next that day. Is there going to be more and more uh, terrorist attack? Are they going to hijack more planes? Uh, and we were getting this news all day long uh, that was just people trying to analyze what's going on. And, you know, there, there were not a whole lot of terrorism experts at the time to, to put it on CNN or Fox News. And we just became a, a disillusioned nation for a while. But you know what September 11th did do? For a moment in time, this country became extremely unified. We had a common enemy, one that would attack our freedom, one that would attack our, um, our liberty, one that would attack our sense of, of justice. And we have, uh, except maybe Pearl Harbor, not been that unified sense. 
and we have things going on today like uh, fires out here in the West, racial tension, um, th the pandemic. There's no unity in politics. Oh my gosh, there's just no more unity anymore. It seems to be gone forever. And I, I certainly don't wish us another terrorist attack to reunify, but do you, do you remember that feeling, George, of, you know, pride in the American flag, uh, pride in, you know, we, we take a stand once again as a nation, not as individuals. It was, it was something. Yes, it was a remarkable day. Uh, tell me about I, the. T I, tell me about it for you. Well, I was uh, had a meeting with the organist at our Saint Elizabeth Saint Elizabeth Episcopal Church in Sebastian, Florida, mm -hmm. where I was the rector, and the secretary came in and said, "You have a call from London. Can you take it?" And they say it's important, and I took the call, and it was the editor Colin Blakely of the Church of England newspaper. And he said, there have been terrorist attacks in New York City. An airplane crashed into the World Trade Center. And the Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, is at Trinity Wall Street right now. Can you call him and find out what's going on? Well, he can tell us. And so I was wound up to go, uh, go sort of get the church angle to this story, to see if Rowan Williams was an eyewitness to the attacks. And, well, of course, the phones were down for Lower Manhattan. So I called the uh, 815, the church headquarters in 815 Second Avenue, and I spoke to some of their press people, and they were looking out their window at the plume of uh, smoke rising from the s s towers, and and uh, I actually heard of one of the towers coming down on the phone, where somebody said, you know, oh my God, it's you know, it's collapsing. Now, I had worked at Tower 4 15 years earlier when I was straight out of college. Uh, I worked for Drexel Burnham Lambert, brokerage firm. And so I knew that area very well. And I can remember I was 21 years old standing at the base of the World Trade Center Towers and you know, my first day on the job and staring up how hot tie these were or going to uh, Windows on the World, the, the restaurant at the very top of one of the towers. And what a sense of magnet, you know, the sense of American power and of, you know, this was the center of the earth sort of thing. Sure. And to have it all come down, the uh, Al-Qaeda was very smart in their selection of targets. The World Trade Center had such a symbolic meaning for New Yorkers and for Americans and for me at that time. It's a remarkable day. Yeah, it really was. I mean, uh, it really, because of the target built into our sense of fear, we had uh, a new understanding of radical Islam. We, uh, at the political level, decided at some point that we're going to go to war and we're going to find uh, these people and take them out and it certainly took about a dozen years but right now Al-Qaeda and uh, uh, radical Islam is you know it, it's not completely over but it's it's been decimated it's it's a shadow of what it was and we did that because we as a country became unified yeah. and when I finally got in touch with Rowan Williams it was such a disappointment because he said we were. I was giving a, le a lecture, and all of a sudden, we were bundled into the crypt of Trinity Wall Street, <laughs> and we were kept there for seven or eight hours. Wow! And so he didn't see or hear anything. He had to ask me what was going on. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, thank goodness the uh, one of the, uh, thank goodness. Well, he wasn't killed. Yeah. So many were killed that well, day. I'm sure you lost friends. Uh, you know, well, people who I had worked before, with earlier, people who I had worked with earlier, fifteen yeah. years earlier, when I was straight out of college, who had stayed in the finance finance sector, who worked in the towers, and I can remember watching CNN and those fo on those films of the people jumping off or falling mm -hmm. off the top of the towers, and it just uh, struck me so very, very uh, emotionally, vividly. Yeah. Well. It, I mean, it's it it's uh, it was akin to my father's generation of he was a child when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, and for them hearing uh, President Roosevelt on the radio and the news flashes, 
uh, was just as traumatic as it was for me watching uh, the news, gosh, 50 years later. Yeah, well, September 11th. 60 and years later. December 7th are certainly uh, days that go down in infamy. Um, they, they, have, they will affect a generation and they will affect, you know, uh, American liberty forever. We will always look back on these times and say, no, we will not let this stand. And uh, it's nice to see when we're united and we can rise up and, and do something together. And I hope, again, as a nation, we can we can come to those terms. But we shall see. George, let's move on to some news, not just the solemn stuff of September 11th. Um, we got news yesterday that uh, there's kind of a, a split in how they're going to handle AMIE in England. And uh, to give a, a quick update here, GAFCON 2, Peter Jensen said, Archbishop Peter Jensen said, listen, we are going to go onto the shores of the Church of England and try and take um, the gospel there using GAFCON, and we're going to uh, have the Anglican mission in England. And after lots of false starts and uh, mismatches and bad news, now they have a new, I, I guess, a strategy, and that is to work as best they can with the two separate groups that they've identified. And uh, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so let, last, let's explain this. Last week, GAFCON UK sent out an email to its supporters saying that we're reorganizing mm -hmm. and we're going to divide into two groups. And the email was not exactly clear as to why and who and what and where. But this was basically carrying out the instructions from the GAFCON Primates Council. So we, contact, I, we contacted GAFCON and we spoke to their press people. And it's the elephant in the room, women's ordination. There are two groups, roughly speaking, within England. Those who hold a complementarian position on women, who don't accept the ordination of women, and those who accept the ordination of women. and. They're creating two parallel convocations, uh, one for essentially the AMIE parishes that do not accept women clergy, who are more akin to, say, the Sydney Anglicans, and then the others, like the Scottish Episcopal Church breakaways, some of the people in Europe, some of the churches in England. Um, they're not making any sort of accommodation one of the things we had when Gavin was with us, we had talked uh, repeatedly about the need for uh, a college approach to, mm -hmm. to be able to speak to the different churchmanships, Anglo-Catholic, charismatic, evangelical, conservative evangelical. And they're not dividing that way. Rather, they're going to divide on the women's issue. That's the stumbling block. Now, Bishop Andy Lyons, uh, we understand, of the AMIE, is to exercise Episcopal jurisdiction over both groups. But that's sort of a, a non-starter, because yeah. if one group has women clergy and present women for ordination and he ordains them, he can't really be a bishop for the people who don't ordain women. I mean, this because is going then he'll have he'll have he'll have. Uh, basically done something that will put him beyond the pale. So this is, uh, it's confused. It well, is. Maybe I should say, I'm confused. Well, I'm I mean, confused about this. They may know exactly everything. I'm just confused about it. Or it's repeating history. Do you remember when the Church of England uh, decided eons ago that they're going to have a uh, women priest? They developed something called flying priest, or flying bishop, sorry. Uh, a bishop uh, who had his hands were clean, he never ordained a, a woman, would uh, be in control of the Anglo-Catholics and would fly to do the consecrations and um, fly to, to ordinations. And are we going to end up in that time again where Andy Lyons is you know, considered a flying bishop? Or is well, it just too convoluted? It yeah, you know, it's just too convoluted. At the... When the, this was all being formed, there was a great deal of ruckus because 
advisors from the ACNA um, would go over to England and help them sort of set up the organizing structure. And bishops from the Free Church of England and Gavin Ashenden and other traditionalists who did not accept the ordination of women really blew up at these guys because they said, well, you know, we think women's ordination is wonderful. We have it in Canada. We have it in Virginia and in Pittsburgh. And we encourage you to do it as well. And so from the very beginning, uh, this uh, stumbling block was there. And they've now reached the point that they need to divide because they're not able to, well, I'm together. assuming here, they're not able to grow yeah. and they're not able to become a stable institution with this insurmountable difficulty. Now, what, it, what did this, you know, what, that's the, a, that's the GAFCON UK. What it does tell me is that uh, the ACNA has done a really good job because they could have gone the same way. Mm. of splitting a year or so after they were formed into an Iker group and a Duncan group yeah. uh, who hold same moral views but have different views on the ordination of women. Yet they've managed to create a structure that allows both to thrive and to flourish. So you, you have to give credit to Bob Duncan and Jack Iker and that original generation and Archbishop Beach and the new generation that they're able to work together over the orders, over the issue of women's clergy. Yeah, I mean, the it's elephant... It's still a live issue for many, many people in the ACNA. On both sides. I mean, it's really a hard issue to deal with, but the fact that they've not split over it is amazing. And especially when you look at the Church of England uh, right now, uh, it's not an issue within the Church of England, but it is an issue with those who've left the Church of England and are seeking uh, GAFCON oversight or GAFCON help. Uh, it's a serious issue. And they're not willing to unite under it. And well, you know. and the Church of England has uh, essentially been not faithful to the promises made twenty odd years ago when they started ordaining women mm -hmm. that those who held to the traditional beliefs of the Church would not be penalized and would have the same chance of preference as uh, those who accepted women's orders. And what we've seen, of course, is that uh, there have been no traditionalists. Uh, elevated to the episcopacy uh with very few exceptions mm -hmm. and we of course we had that uh that terrible uh, situation where andy north uh, andrew north was to be bishop of sheffield and he does Philip, was he's it an Philip north? catholic north yeah yes north okay uh, <laughs> uh, make sure friends correct me if i'm wrong no no i thought it was, i thought his name was philip i'm sorry i just okay it's north bishop north <laughs> bishop uh, it, it, Send us, tell us, tell me the right name. It's unscripted after all, folks. Oh I don't gosh, have, yes. I'm not Joe Biden. I don't have a teleprompter in front of me to make sure I do it right. We should, though. <laughs> Bishop North was uh, was uh, named to be Bishop of Sheffield, mm -hmm. and he didn't accept the ordination of women, but he said, you know, he would make a, make allowances and be sort of generous in his oversight on this issue but the women's or, women's ordination people just threw a fit and just made life so difficult that north was bullied into uh turning down the post yeah i mean so the promise there is no there is no uh the promises made of equal treatment were long ago abandoned and everybody knows this in the church of england yeah mutual flourishing never worked and uh, it just wasn't going to um but that was a promise and I'm glad we don't see that type of promise made in the ACNA. Um, the promise is that we will continue to work together. You know, we will continue to, to seek an answer to this. Um, we will meet as a house of bishops and continue to talk about this and hash out the tough things. But they've always said we want to keep the real thing the real thing and that the church is about Jesus and not about our arguments. And mm -hmm. that is just, it's wonderful to watch. Uh, the ACNA working that way. ACNA has some problems. Don't we're not saying the ACNA is perfect. Uh, I've seen some uh, uh, discussions recently on Facebook about some of the the issues they're having with uh, some people. Critical race theory and uh, oh gosh, just like we, we got we got some Looney Tunes out there. Folks. We do, uh, and uh, please highlight the Looney Tunes so th the, the bishops can become aware and hopefully address that uh, accountability within the ACNA. Uh, is as good as it gets. Uh, it's wonderful to see uh, over the last 
uh, 10 years at least that there have uh, defrocked priests and they've recently uh, taken uh, a, a bishop off the uh, house of bishop rolls because uh, there is accountability within the church and I would hope that that would reach the canon level as well so we shall see um, what other news we want to discuss George well we want to discuss uh, it really is telling uh, private eye Private Eye magazine is a sort of a British uh, scandal rag. We have nothing equivalent to that in the United States, nothing at all. And Private Eye usually talks about the peccadillos, the politicians, mm -hmm. and things of that nature. But and all of their articles are unsigned, or most of their articles are unsigned, so you don't know who's doing it. But they've recently had some scoops on the Church of England, which. It tells you a great deal about the health of the press these days that Private Eye is leading, is the leading reporter on the Church of England right now in England. One of their recent articles at the end of August said that there, uh, there are 30 bishops under safeguarding investigation in the Church of England. Not priests, you, you just said bishops. Bishops, Wow. I'm talking bishops. Now, the Church of England has made an absolute hash out of its safeguarding policies. It's politicized, it's unfair, it's secretive, they're insiders and outsiders. We recently, yesterday, Martin Percy, the Dean of Christchurch Cathedral in Oxford, who went through a long internal wrangling with uh, members of his college uh, over uh, you know, college fights or the mm -hmm. nastiest fights of all at the faculty meeting. Well, somebody made a complaint uh, to the Church of England because Percy is a priest and the Christ Church is also a cathedral. And the persons making the complaint were also part of the investigating body in the Church of England. And this was pointed out and they had to drop it. And finally, Percy was cleared of all wrongdoing, but not after the poor man, oh, between the two cases, spent almost a half million pounds defending himself. It's a political prosecute, persecution prosecution. Uh, Martin Percy, though he's very liberal, is a gadfly to the establishment, just as they're conservative gadflies. Well, George Carey uh, was uh, stood down last two months ago. Re his license to officiate was removed. He found out about this from the press, who was asking him about it, because 30 years ago, a uh, Smythe, John Smythe, the uh, pervert, uh, was a day, was a part-time student at the theological college he ran. And therefore, uh, what did he know and when did he know about Smythe's peccadillos? And he was removed from officiating. And the only other active bishop who's removed with, from officiating is the Bishop of Lincoln, Christopher Lowson. And those two, Carey and Lowson, are removed for not having done something. Well, there are 20 other bishops who have had similar complaints, but they've not been removed from office or stood down. And there are eight bishops, seven or eight bishops, who are accused of actually doing something and not just being turning, turning their eyes and not doing something, but actually being abusers. Wow. And one of them is Justin Welby. He's not accused of being an abuser. He's accused of having known about uh, the Jonathan Fletcher situation and we learned from Private Eye that in 2017 there was an investigation, but nobody told the victim, nobody told anybody. And now there's another investigation. And Welby, uh, the rules that applied to Carey are not applied to Welby. The rules that applied to Lowson are not applied to Welby or the art, new Archbishop of York, Cottrell. It's just farcical, the way they operate these things. Farcical. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not saying these guys are guilty, and I, what I am, uh, and I'm not making. I don't know whether Welby is innocent or not. I assume that he is. Yeah. But what I'm exercised about is the uneven exercise of authority and power. That there's some rules for people like Bishop Lowson and Bishop Carey, Archbishop Carey, and then the rules for Justin Welby and Stephen Cantrell. Different standards. Yeah, it's it's hypocrisy. It's unfair. Um, and basically, at this level, it ruins people's careers in life. Um, you know, we all, this will always and it be bankrupts a, them. And it, it bankrupts them. I mean, them. It, they've got to hire outside attorneys to fight this if they want to keep mm -hmm. their jobs. And mm -hmm. 
We've received emails from a, a one London priest who basically reported he was the verge of self-harm because of what this has done to him. And, uh, you know, we encouraged him. I encouraged him to see sure. Absolutely. help, not church help, but <laughs> medical help. <laughs> but the, the, the system uh, is so perverse. And it all ties in, you know, ties back into the whole George Bell thing where that we need to put out a sacrificial victim. Let's put up a dead guy. We need to show that we're tough on bishops. Let's take the Bishop of Lincoln and old George Carey and sh and everybody else will be protected. But we'll just make examples of these guys with minor, if that, infractions to protect yeah, those who've done worse things. We're kind of going long today, just because it's September 11th. But I saw somewhere in in some exclusive global thing somewhere that Rowan Williams and Justin Welby are coming to America to to teach. And I'm like, wow! Wait a minute, isn't there a isn't that an old Eddie Murphy movie? Yeah, coming <laughs> yeah that's right. <laughs> coming to America, and so I'm like, wow! Wait a minute. Aren't we under COVID travel restrictions? How on earth are they going to get here? And I said, well, I know who could find out for me. George, uh, when does their flight arrive and where are they preaching? Well, Justin Welby is preaching on the 27th, Sunday, the 27th of September at Washington mm -hmm. National Cathedral. Mm -hmm. And Rowan Williams is preaching this month also at Christ Church in Greenwich, uh, Connecticut. And... I saw the I saw some reports about this and it's being played up that these guys are coming and and people sent me emails how can you know what's so special about them that they can violate the travel bans because only government officials can come here or you know his well be and on Williams government officials well so what do you do I called the cathedral <laughs> and uh, I sent a note to Lambeth Palace Lambeth Palace says, we don't know what you're talking about. The 27th of September, Justin Welby is doing ordinations in Canterbury. Uh, he's recording something uh, earlier in the week to be played uh, in London, in England, in America. And the cathedral in Washington says, oh, well, the Bishop of Washington will be celebrating communion at the cathedral, but we're going to have a special video virtual sermon from Ro Justin Welby. Hmm. And Rowan Williams is doing a virtual sermon in Connecticut. Now, I was interested in this because I thought, well, th if they are coming to America, this will be the beginning, the first steps to return to normalcy, that the COVID pandemic is backing down and this travel re restrictions, and it's first taking place with the archbishops. And, but no, folks, no. It's a, they're making <laughs> virtual stops in the U.S. Oh, wow. It's always something with a V. All right. Well, George, I want to thank you again for your time. Uh, it's Friday. I, I, we are currently at, at Francis Slocum State Park in Pennsylvania. We'll be traveling back to Connecticut for a week to uh, uh, make some uh, maintenance stuff on the RV before we head back out. Uh, you do anything busy next week? It's appearing on Anglican Unscripted. <laughs> of course. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 618 of Anglican Unscripted.